What up everyone, it's your favorite Brooklyn boy, Anthony Carano, coming to you live with Cafe Meets Coaches. This will be a podcast centered around contemporary physical education for the masses. We'll go over a range of different topics such as skill acquisition, fitness planning, and how movement plays a role in the development of mind, body, and spirit. My goal is to help bridge the gap between academia and practice, connecting friends, colleagues, and future professionals with the motivation to move and the knowledge to do so efficiently. As the title suggests, some of the shows will be recorded in person at a cafe. If this is one of those episodes, you'll hear some background noise in the podcast. Hopefully you too will feel as though you're there with us. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. So, um, you know, first off, I just want to say thank you for jumping on the podcast. Uh, I've been following you probably the longest I've ever followed a strength coach. Um, I think you know the name Pat Davidson, may, may not. I feel like I might have mentioned it to you before, but he was my professor at Brooklyn College. And- I remember you telling me this story. Yeah. Sadly, he's gone off the rails. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I look no I literally like I've blocked him on all social media. I don't I don't even pay any attention to him. He's crazy. <laughs> That's funny to hear your perspective. Uh he you know, he's definitely uh extreme that I could say about him for sure. But um but yeah, he was my professor. He was the one who uh pointed me towards you in the beginning and since then I've been following you uh forever. Read all your books, uh you know, Huge fan, super happy to have you on on a podcast. Uh, I thought it was a long shot to get you on, and uh, you made it happen for me, so I appreciate that. No problem. I I try to do as many of them as I can do. I mean, it it seems like now there's at least you know there's one or one or two a week, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before I jump into any questions or intros or any of that stuff. Uh, I usually like to start with one of these fun uh, questions on a card here. It's kind of totally random, unrelated to fitness, but you get two options. So I'm going to pull out a random one here. It says, um, have you ever become best friends with one of your enemies or what crowd were you a part of in high school? (laughs) Uh, Have I ever become best friends with one of my enemies? Let me think. I would say probably not. I don't think I ever have. I've probably mended some fences. I've probably developed some relationships with people maybe that I wasn't friendly with initially. I don't know that I've ever become best friends with one of my enemies. I would say uh, I have a small circle of people that I would call best friends. And most of them were not people that I started out by not liking. Right. Right. Uh, Awesome. So We'll get right into it. I know I have a lot of questions that I, uh, you know, have prepared. I know we won't get to them all, but I'm sure I could talk with you for days. But so just to give most people will know who you are in your background, but, you know, maybe a little brief introduction of, uh, you know, your experience and and where you've been on your journey, where you are now. Uh, So I am 63 years old. I have been doing this for I think this is my 41st year of actually coaching. I got right out of Springfield College and pretty much went right to work. I spent a year kind of bouncing around the health club industry a little bit. And then I spent six months at BU, Boston University, as an athletic trainer, which is what I went to school for. But when I was in school, I realized that strength and conditioning was going to be a real profession at the time. Now, imagine this is originally like, 1977 1978 and strength and conditioning was not a consideration there it was not something that people were thinking hey I want to do this there were no personal trainers there were no strength and conditioning coaches at least not that I knew of and uh when I got to Boston University I had a couple of friends who from college who had gotten jobs as strength and conditioning coaches and I thought wow I can actually do this and Boston University doesn't have a strength and conditioning coach they also didn't have a budget and or a desire for a strength and conditioning coach. But I quit my job at probably 22. I quit my athletic training job and I've started volunteering as the strength and conditioning coach at Boston University. So I legitimately walked out of the athletic training room, walked across the hallway into a room that had a couple of bench press stations, a couple of squat racks and a few Nautilus machines and set up shop as the strength coach at Boston University. I was lucky enough 
Uh, there are some New York connections. Rick Pitino was the basketball coach at that time. And Rick Pitino wanted his players to train. Mm. Um, was in the process of hiring me. He immediately left as Rick Pitino has a tendency to do. And mm. uh, so I never ended up working for Rick Pitino, but his assistant, John Kuster, who ended up coaching in the NBA also hired me to run the preseason program for basketball. I think they gave me a hundred dollars for, for the fall. So it probably came out to about a dollar an hour mm. when it was all said and done. And uh, I was on my way to being a college strength coach. I wow. from there opened, started, took, actually worked at BU probably eight years part-time mm. hired me full-time at, uh, at 30 and about the same time the Boston Bruins offered me a job again, part-time because pro teams is still at that time. So imagine 19, I'm trying to think probably 90 ish. Mm. These teams are not hiring full-time strength coaches. So I worked at BU at basically full-time and then I worked for the Bruins part-time. And I did that for, I think, eight or nine seasons mm. with Bruins. And then at that same time, I started realizing that there were all these pro hockey players in the Boston area or, or uh, hopeful pro hockey players, guys who were playing in the minors. And I started training guys like that. That led to me building up a training business on the side while I was at Boston University. And then in 19, I think, 97, we opened Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. So that was about 25 years ago and started to train athletes with a program similar to what we had been doing in college. Mm. So, I mean, I, I could go on forget forever with the chronology, yeah. but uh, then 2012, the Red Sox talked me into going to work for them for a couple of years. So I left Boston university. Finally, I bounced between, I was working part-time at BU and then running or helping to run Mike Boyle strength and conditioning at the same time. And, uh, that was from 97 till 2012. I worked for the Red Sox. I think the 12 and 13 seasons mm. Managed to get a world series ring out of the 13th season and then retired from the baseball world with the world series ring. And congrats. Basically have been doing Mike Boyle strength and conditioning for the last 10 years. So do you um, work with only athletes there or also general population? Actually, no, our bigger or more of our business now is probably general population than athletes, truthfully. And that was another one thing we've been very good at is kind of reading the tea leaves and seeing which way the wind was blowing, however you want to, whatever cliche you want to use. Yeah. And we started to realize that there was probably more business in that adult market initially as personal training, because we had people coming to us and saying, or coming to me and saying, Hey, can you train me? And I said, no, but I have these great coaches that work with me. They can train you. And that led us when the whole CrossFit thing started, I would say probably maybe CrossFit started to, to explode around 2000 mm. and that made kind of group. I'm not a CrossFit fan. I will say that clearly, but that made group functional training or group, whatever training popular. So we mm. started to do adult groups. So we've just been gradually growing this business from a, a purely athlete training business to a, a personal training business. Now I, I would say, Personal training, one to one training, probably is fifty percent of our revenue. Mm, wow. Yeah, and then our athlete revenue is probably pretty evenly split between, uh, or the other half of the revenue is probably pretty evenly split between adults and uh, athletes. So, um, most of the people that are listening will probably be more general population, personal training, mm -hmm. a crowd, but. There'll also be a handful of people here that are coaches and work with athletes and may probably at the high school level, could even be middle school, college, et cetera. But, you know, kind of focusing a little more, little bit on the general population uh, conversation first. Um, you know, I often think sometimes we put the horse before the carriage a bit. Like when I think of strength and conditioning, I think about uh, enhancing performance but it's, I almost think about the realm of you have to be uh, performing something first, right? It's like you're a strength coach for hockey, but you play hockey, or you're a strength coach for football, but you also play football. And, um, you know, I'm curious your opinion as to, for general population, is strength and conditioning in and of itself enough? Or 
do you think that some adults should also be participating in some type of activity or playing pickleball or, you know, something outside of the gym? I, I think, well, I guess I could say, should they, I mean, obviously it wouldn't be bad to have some sort of interest outside the gym. I think in general, when you look at the adult exercise statistics, most adults, 90% of them are not exercising. Mm. In 90%, there are people who consider taking a walk to be exercise. So mm. when you start thinking about a well-organized, whatever you want to call it, you know, strength and conditioning program, training program, we have our clients, we, we put a premium on power. So we are throwing medicine balls. We're doing basic plyometrics. We do not sprint. We are not aggressive with our adults at all. We don't Olympic lift. I think that's one of the big distinctions between us and CrossFit. As you know, they'll, you won't see in our adult program, you won't see a barbell, period. Mm. You won't see somebody barbell bench press. You won't see somebody deadlift. You won't see somebody barbell squat. Uh, but I think, I, you know, the bar has been set really, really low in the adult fitness world. We're trying to raise the bar, mm. but I think, you know, saying people should incorporate some sort of sporting pursuit is really unrealistic in my mind. And you can probably look at it differently because you're much younger. Right. And do you have kids? No, not yet. No. Okay. So <laughs> if you combine, <laughs> right, you combine being younger and not having kids, one, your body is, is way more geared to say, whatever, rec, soccer, pick up basketball, you know, volleyball, whatever it is. And you don't have another group of two or three people to worry about during the course of the day in terms of you don't have a spouse, you don't have two kids, you aren't figuring out where, how do I get that kid from point A to point B so that they can do the things that they need to do. So for us, we very much talk about our adult clients. I, I, I like the term check the box clients. Mm. There are people who want to get two or three one hour workouts in a week and they want those one hour workouts to be really well designed and to be really productive. Mm. And I think that's one thing that we're really good at. We're really good at designing a program for an adult that is going to be safe, but effective and interesting. It's not going to be boring. It's not go in and do the machines. It's not walk on the treadmill. It's if you walked in, you would think like if you watched our program, you'd say, wow, they train exactly the way the athletes do. Mm. And we do. With some really obvious modifications and the, the most obvious modification being we don't sprint you start asking adults to sprint particularly adults now are you know a big part of our clientele i would say 40 to 60 you're asking for hamstring pulls and achilles tendon tears and they they will run it's funny we don't sprint and we don't jog mm. we do run and i feel there is something in between sprinting and jogging sprinting is trying to go as fast as you can probably a bad idea jogging is trying to maintain a steady pace in my mind for a long period of time also a bad idea running mm -hmm. trying to get into hip extension and trying to to move maybe faster than you would move normally probably mm -hmm. a good idea mm -hmm. so you have them run in the program you said what is it do you, do you time them still no uh, we don't time our adults at all never and that's what's funny we i make the staff turn the timers off okay like, not, because we had a guy pull his hamstring the other day because somebody did incorporate in the program kind of a, it was the idea, you know, we're going to sprint for 10 yards, then we're going to jog, then we're going to walk. But we had probably hadn't got to the 20th person sprinting <laughs> 10 yards and somebody had already pulled the hamstring and was limping around. Um, <laughs> right. So, so no, guess... no, no timing because again, adults are in one thing that's great about them. They're entirely unrealistic about their fitness. They have no, they, they, they're not accepting of the fact that I, you know, you, somewhere in your questions, you had alluded to my filet mignon beef jerky. Uh, yeah, yeah, analogy. Yeah. And most of these adult clients have not accepted yet that they're much closer to the beef jerky stage of life than they are to the filet mignon stage of life. Right. And we always talk about, so, you know, one of the ways we define when people say, how do you define what's an adult client? Mm. Like an adult client is someone who has stopped playing a sport for a living. Mm. So when you have, when your primary job involves getting up and going to work, I'm going to train you with that objective in mind. The number one thing I want you to be able to do is go to work the next day, mm. which means, you know, I don't want you tearing your Achilles. I don't want you pulling your hamstring. I don't want you pulling your groin. 
I want you to be able to go to work and be a, a productive citizen, somebody who can earn the living that they need to earn so that they can provide for their family, yet someone that is moving more towards health than away from health. Because most of us as adults are moving further away from health all the time. And that's why I think it's it's so unrealistic when you look at people, you know, you look at the the expectations. And this is why I said you got to stop me from rambling, but um, no, you're good. You're good. You look at the expectations where people say walking is exercise, gardening is exercise. I mean, that's not exercise. Right, right, right. Movement. But right. it's not exercise. But we've lowered the bar so far that it seems to be okay if so, oh, get out and take a walk for 20 minutes. Mm. That should be like you're in addition to the mm. number one thing you should do. And this is why I've become a huge fan of Peter Atia. Mm. I don't know if you've listened to his the drive podcast, but he does a great job. He's a medical doctor and he really is pushing the idea that exercise, you know, strength training, interval training, aerobic training is probably the most effective medicine that you can provide to people. Mm. So I always tell our coaches and, and half, half jokingly, but I tell them we're the greatest medical professionals in the world mm. because we're providing the most, the most vital medicine that you can, particularly into that adult population. Mm. So when it comes to adults, you know, I know you mentioned a little bit about like how much is enough. So are you uh, focusing on power and uh, you know, movement and strength and like, are you prioritizing one thing over another? Uh, we are definitely not prioritizing one thing over another, but we are putting, yes, but in the sense that we are putting them in order. So mm. power is we are the first thing that we will do. Well, the first thing that we do, you know, is we warm up. So we're going to prioritize, um, you know, warm up and mobility and proper movement. Mm. And then before we ever pick up a weight, we'll then prioritize power in the mm. sense that, we will do medicine ball throws and we will do jumps. And the one thing I always say for an adult, power is moving faster than you normally move. Mm. So you could look at the agility ladder and think power exercise for an adult because we're forcing them to change direction and decelerate on one leg. So mm. it is an effect. Some people might look at that and say, you know, I wouldn't call that an extensive plyometric drill for an athlete but I would call it a low intensity plyometric drill for one of our adults. So the drills are very, very simple, you know, low box jumps, low hurt, you know, six inch hurdle hops, things like that. But, but we are trying to get them to move faster than how they would move in the course of their normal day-to-day -day activity. Mm. That's all good stuff. Um, still on the topic of general population, bodybuilding, do you think that, you know, when you look at fitness nowadays, it, it seems like in most places, you know, not a, uh, a gym like yours, but in your typical, you know, planet fitness or whatever else, there's a lot of people who are attending those types of gyms, a crunch or this or that. And I feel like there's still this emphasis on physique building more than anything and uh, bodybuilding. And it almost, you know, the more inside I get nowadays, I feel as though it seems it's as if it's an unhealthy goal to have. And uh, I'm curious your opinion. Uh, very simple. Total waste of time. <laughs> I cannot, I can't believe yeah. that anybody still does and or recommends body part workouts. It's, mm. it has to be, I mean, the most inefficiently, the most inefficient way you could possibly train. Mm. To look and think, Cause that's the person, oh, you know, I go to the, I go to the gym five days a week and I do chest one day and back another day and arms another day and legs another day. I think, wow, that is the dumbest. I, it's the dumbest of the dumb. And not even just the, I guess the way that they program it, but meaning just the idea of bodybuilding as a goal. So meaning that like you're coming here to train, uh, to look better and which is, I understand it, but it almost seems as if, uh, it's a, it's just not the best goal for a general population or oh, it's everybody. clearly not. I mean, it's, it, I mean, even, but bodybuilding fat loss, you need to be way more global than that. You know, we always tell everybody your goal should be to one, feel better, not mm. worse. And two, 
for your system to function better. When you're trying to break your system down into individual muscle actions, you know, bicep, tricep, whatever, fly, that's not how your body works. Mm. And it's not going to work well in the real world settings that you're going to put it in. And so, yeah, I just, I mean, I'm completely and utterly anti-bodybuilding in every way. And bodybuilding, I, it had its place because for so many of us, and even for me, it was my introduction to strength training. Mm. It it was, you know, Strength and Health magazine and Ironman and Muscle and Fitness and all that stuff. But it's so outdated that to me, I'm always amazed. I We see it now. It's funny with the kids. Mm. Uh, my son's friends, not the kids that train with me, but my son's sort of normal school friends mm. don't even know they do it. But because of the Instagram influences, they bodybuild. Mm. They go to the gym and I, you know, I'll say to them, what'd you do? Oh, I did back yesterday or I did legs. And I'm like, really? <laughs> right. That's what you did yesterday. But that's like incredibly regressive, unathletic. It's just, Right. It's so foolish to me. But like the it people is... that would, would want it the most. Sorry to cut you off there. You know, I feel like you mentioned in your book as well, like different body types. The people that would want it the most are the body types uh that it's least attainable to genetically wise. Right. Uh, meaning like it well, requires the other is, so much work. it's all a charade, it's all drugs. Right. I mean, anybody like and that's part of the problem too, is that people don't realize they, they don't look like even I know when I was a kid. You know, when I'd look at Arnold and Franco Colombo and Lou Ferrigno and these guys, I had no idea that I couldn't look like that, mm. which mm. in some ways was great because I went and probably trained really hard with the idea that, hey, if I do that, you know, I'll look like Arnold or I'll look like Franco or I'll look like the Hulk. Mm. And then, you know, years later, I'd look and think, wow, I'm not very good at this because things aren't changing the way that they seem to be for these guys. And I'm I'm doing everything they say in the muscle magazine article that I'm supposed to be doing. Why aren't I changing? Mm. And they left out the part that they were, you know, dabbling in thousands of milligrams of androgens. Now you get it in our world, in today's world, that's, you know, dad on TRT. Right. Right. And, and they, you know, people say, Oh, well, I'm on to, you know, you look at some guys in the gym and they're just absolutely shredded Jack. They look like drugged up bodybuilders. And then they'll be like, well, yeah, you know, I've had low testosterone. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> that, that's, but, but there's a, I mean, I'd say there's more of that now than there is steroid use. I'd say there's more guys being legally prescribed, you know, testosterone replacement therapy, steroids. Right. Than, than there are people doing illegal steroids. Yeah. So when it comes to, I think you answered my question earlier. Uh, you know, I mentioned like the filet mignon program for people that don't know, that was like more so your top athlete who's coming in and this is like the cream of the crop and we're giving them uh, maybe a slightly different program than our, uh, you know, general population. At what point, you know, with, with general population, can we just start with the non filet mignon program? Now, the reason I say that is because the filet mignon program puts a lot of stress on the body was what you alluded to. And I was, I, you know, trying to say to myself, why not just start with the low stress? So meaning, um, you know, if there's something that I would take out because it puts a high stress, you know, maybe a, a back squat or a front squat. And I know you're not a big fan of those either, but, you know, general population, should they just start with the uh, things that put lower stress on the body, like just oh, start with rear foot elevated squats. Like don't even, there's no, no I mean, people should start with, I mean, start with body weight squats. The good thing I always, mm -hmm. and I've said this and that's probably in my new book, but the basic idea, if you had someone say, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to hold a five pound plate on my chest and I'm going to do 10 squats. Right. I'm simply going to go up by five pounds a week. Mm. And I'm going to do just 10 squats every week. Second week, I'm going to do 10 pounds. Third week, I'm going to do 15 pounds. That person would be doing 260 pound squats mm. by the end of year one. So mm. there's no reason to start aggressively because you've got so much time and room to improve. So we start with a lot of body weight, particularly we start with body weight, lower body stuff mm. because body weight is sufficient. So body weight, split squats, body weight, one leg SLDLs, body weight squats, those types of things. And then we start with, 
less than body weight upper body exercises. I think they, people always used to say, oh, do body weight before external resistance. Start with pull-ups and push-ups. That doesn't make any sense again because the average adult can't do that. So we're going to start with we're going to start with dumbbell bench press, dumbbell incline bench press. We're going to start with some type of pull down. We're going to start with simple upper body exercises, but we're thinking instead of thinking patterns or instead of thinking muscles, we're thinking patterns. Mm. So we're going to think maybe we're going to do two pushing exercises and two pulling exercises for upper body. And maybe we're going to do one more knee dominant, one type of squat and one type of hip hinge for mm. our adult population. And then we're simply going to progress from there. Mm. And um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, talking about exercise selection. There was a point in the book where you said uh, when a squat is not safe, a safe choice. Um, so are you normally doing single leg uni unilateral stuff with your adults? Yep. And it's, you know, is there ever a time that you would not have them squat? Because there's times you said where it's not a safe choice. I mean, I don't think so because we're talking about bodyweight squat. I think squat's not a safe choice when you're talking about a loaded back squat. I think bodyweight squat is almost as safe as you can possibly get. It'd be very, very difficult to get somebody hurt in a bodyweight squat. But we're, again, but in our situation, we're never going to put a barbell on an adult's back. Like, just not going to happen. So... Would you say that you're, is it still considered strength and conditioning or is it now personal training? Like how would you define strength and conditioning? I mean, we call it adult functional training. That's, that's the term that we use. And mainly because we've been kind of whether for better or for worse associated with this concept of functional training. So mm -hmm. that's how we're going to introduce it to our adults. That's how we're going to sell it to our adults. But the fact of the matter is I, I always talk about the recipe, the recipe remains exactly the same. If you watched our athletes come in, our athletes come in and they foam roll. If you watch our adults come in, our adults come in and they foam roll. If you watch mm -hmm. our athletes come in after they foam roll, they stretch. If you watch our adults come in after they foam roll, they stretch. Mm -hmm. If you watch our athletes come in, they then go into a dynamic warm up. If you watch our adults, they then go into a dynamic warm up. Mm -hmm. our, our athletes do their plyometric drills and their medicine ball drills. Our adults do their plyometric drills and their medicine ball drills. We're simply scaling them up or down based on the level of the person that's going to be there. The place that the program gets different, our athletes are then going to sprint. They're going to time sprint. Mm. Our adults are not going to time sprint. Our athletes are then going to do some sort of loaded power exercise, mm. clean snatch, trap bar jump. Our adults are not going to do that. But then the strength program, again, looks surprisingly similar. You know, our adults are generally like our three-day-a-week athletes are going to do some kind of pushing exercise and some sort of squatting exercise. And mm. so are our personal training clients. We're going to do a pulling exercise and some kind of hip oriented hip extension type exercise. Our athletes and our adults are going to do that. So the, the recipe is very minimally different. Mm. And, um, you know, you made me think about one of the questions I had about jumping. So you do time sprints with your athletes. Do you you know, it almost made me think, why not do measured jumps? We do. We actually you, have. So we've got a just jump. Mat and, and yeah, regularly, I, I, at least ideally every week. Again, some of it depends on time. But yeah, so our athletes are are doing time sprinting and measured jumping. Mm. Uh, another big movement that's been happening nowadays, the Postural Restoration Institute, PRI, everybody. I know it's create, created a lot of buzz in the field. and. In your last book, uh, I didn't see much about it. This one, I was, uh, you know, excited to see that you had to mention, and it seemed like you made it some changes. You know, you made some changes to your program a bit. I'm curious, what are some of those changes? Um, you know, regarding core training or breathing exercises. Um, you know, other some things that maybe you learned from PRI that made you uh, make some changes to your workout. Yeah, PRI, Postural Restoration Institute. I'll be honest, I think, and it's really funny, I posted a, I posted a great meme the other day that uh, I don't even know the guy's name is. It was Compound Performance that put it up. But uh, a PRI, I think, is a stage that everybody goes through in terms of as they're moving. You know, it's a, he said everybody starts kind of with an NASM and gets an NASM cert, and then they get an FRC cert, and then they move to PRI. And that, it's all sort of part of the process. 
the truth is we learned a lot. We changed very little. Mm. Uh, we, we probably made a couple of really fundamental changes in our core training program, mainly looking at more intentional breathing, mm. trying to nasal inhale, trying to purse lip exhale, trying to realize that our deep abdominal musculature is involved in end stage exhalation. So I think understanding kind of the anatomy of breath, understanding that, okay, I inhale through my nose, my diaphragm actually contracts and descends. Mm. So I've literally got a breathing muscle inside of me that is activated by the act of inhaling. Mm. Then I've got these more exterior muscles abdominal muscles, internal oblique, external oblique, transverse abdominis, those muscles are activated by exhaling. So when I try to maximally exhale, blow all my air out, you know, a really long, what you realize is that engages your core musculature more. Mm. I hate using the words engage your core because that sounds terrible. It sounds so cliche, but, but it does. A long, hard exhalation is a really good deep abdominal exercise. So those are really, I mean, after all is said and done with PRI, that's basically what came out of it. But also what came out of it is a really good respect for handedness mm. and realizing that the body, I think, because in the if you think of yourself and you kind of, again, you go through a lot of people will go through the FMS stage and the FMS functional movement systems is very much about symmetry and developing symmetrical movement. And mm. then PRI teaches you that, Symmetry is not attainable because you're anatomically asymmetrical when you realize that my heart is on my left and my liver is on my right. Like I've got this body that isn't symmetrical. I've got this diaphragm that has kind of two different shaped domes because mm. of where my heart is and where my liver is and all these things. So um, you start to realize, wow, I'm, I'm really trying to balance my asymmetry out. Mm. More than I am trying All to right, I'm going to shut this. my window here. I'm in Brooklyn and there's a lot of beeping. I don't know if you can hear it. I can't, but no problem. Oh, good. I'm in Brooklyn, so I still have the horns beeping outside my house. But go ahead. Sorry, I oh, cut you. Off. No, I said, so I don't think, I don't think that it, at the end of it all, there was not a tremendous amount of change as a result of PRI. And I think if you have a good program, Mm. There shouldn't be a lot of changes as a result of any educational experience. I always think if you have an educational experience and that causes you to dispose of large parts of your program or maybe even to change your program completely, you didn't have a very good program to begin with. So yeah, I think for us, all of our changes are more subtle. Time sprints, big change, more subtle. I mean, if you look you know, what's the difference? Well, the difference is five minutes during the workout, we're running a couple of sprints maximally and keeping track of those times. That's a huge change for us, but actually a really small change based on the total scope of the program. Hmm. So I think that's what you need to be looking at. Yeah. Um, I definitely appreciate the slow and steady change. <laughs> you know, it's it's nice also, though, that you do reflect and do make some uh, changes that you feel are worth it too. Some people are too rigid, some too flexible. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And you should be constantly looking. I always think, and I forget who it was, but it, it might've been Kevin Neal, who's now the uh, Bruins strength coach, but who had uh, done some work with me with our women's national program. But, and I, I give him credit, even though it may not have been him, but whoever it was said, if everybody's talking about the same thing, you should at least be looking at that thing. So if everybody's talking about PRI, if all the smart people that you know are talking about PRI, you should at least take a peek at PRI and say, okay, you know, what do those three letters stand for? Why are all these smart people that I know suddenly showing some interest in this? And mm -hmm. then make your own decision. Yeah. But you don't want to, you don't want to not look. Yeah. Yeah. You don't I to agree. decide on a very limited, uh, you know, a limited dive. So one of the, things that I felt that I took away from your chapter in the book was stabilize the core, move through the hips. So yeah. lumbar spine, you know, that's like your typical old school, uh, you know, way of lifting, you know, you're moving at the lumbar spine, arching the lower back. Uh, however, you're saying core tight train, you know, uh, maybe whether it's a plank or whether it's anti-rotational, uh, stuff, chops, lifts, all those good things that are in your book and uh, people can check out on their own uh, and then move through the hips. And 
I think one of your uh, warm up exercises are kind of like in a, you know, uh, on all fours and um, keeping the core tight and moving the femur or the thigh pretty much through a range of motion to show that, uh, you know, the ability to move through hips without moving lumbar spine. Right. And that, that to me, that's the key to avoiding low back pain right there. You described it. Yeah. Being able to move, being able to move your hips without moving, without compensatory movement of the lumbar spine. The spine is always going to move. Mm. And that's where I think people get screwed up. People think we're trying to develop this, this rigidity and people that don't move at all and that are very robotic. It's like, that's not what we're trying to do at all. And that's why I think in the new book, I used the analogy of the core muscles being like the ropes on the sail. Mm. There's going to be times when you want that sail to be really, really stiff and you need something literally to rein it in that rope. Right. Mm. And that's, what's going to really make the boat go. And mm. I think you've got to look at it that way in terms of, you know, we're not, you know, we, we're not putting a board up and letting the wind blow against the board, mm. but we are going to have a sail, something that's movable and something that's flexible. And then we're going to figure out how to harness the energy within that sail. That's mm. really when you start to understand, okay, I'm, I'm starting to grasp what's going on here from a core training perspective in terms of it's not rigidity. It's not the mast, right? Mm. What's really driving the boat is the sail. Mm. But the mast, you know, maybe the spine, the spine's got to be, this mast's got to be really stiff. But I'm mm. going to get to you that mast is bending, right? Mm. I'm not saying, sorry, I apologize. And that sure. may happen again unless my wife figures out that it's coming into her somehow. <laughs> her phone brought it to my computer and it, it rings through. That's all right. That's all right. Um, more of those in a second. No, no worries. I'm sure she'll call more, call more than once. <laughs> um, do you want to let her know? Or? No, that's fine. I'm just going to text her. You can keep talking. Keep going. So thinking about breathing, um, you know, so I know the long exhale helps to engage the core or the, you know, abs and, uh, you know, it's all that is great. I was thinking about in regard to strength training in and of itself, how do you have your athletes breathe? So I know Honestly, there's all different... truthfully, we don't even talk about it. Okay. So that you know, and I because I think I think where we got really screwed up in the whole core training process yeah. was when we tried to start incorporate some of these concepts into actual lifting. Mm. And and then I think we tried to do that because there was a time where, you know, they were saying, you know, okay, before you squat, before you do anything, you know, draw your abs in, try to get tight. And you'd have people, you know, get, you know, you'd have people chasing people around doing next. Oh, you don't engage your core. Think about what your core is doing. It's like, we don't do that. We're like, lift the weight. <laughs> More than likely, reflexively, your core musculature will do what it's supposed to do if it's been properly prepared to do that. Hmm. So we don't, you will never, hear us really talk about breathing maybe you know like if someone's bench pressing trying to get okay really big inhale so you can get a big chest you know to, to and i think about that more as minimizing the distance you're going to bring the bar down so i don't want somebody lowering the bar in the bench press without taking a really big inhale if we were still back squatting i would really cue somebody okay again really big inhale to to, to generate more some stiffness you know i used to always take like, if you think it's the opposite of what you want, mm. but it's not really when you look and think, hey, lungs, you know, I got airbags inside the system. So if I was going to put something really heavy on my back, it might be a good idea to fill up the airbags, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we don't tend to do that. So we aren't as worried about that because we're not doing really heavy, compressive spinal loading type of stuff. Yeah. And I guess it also makes me think a little bit more in the lens of power. So my martial art, I'm sorry, my background is martial arts. I've done that for a long time. I know you kind of gave it a shout out in the book regarding breathing. Like that's maybe where the judo kia is from. And I almost think, um, you know, that exhale, a sharp exhale <laughs> on a power exercise could potentially be beneficial, whether it's a med ball throw or whether, uh, you know, if it's a quick explosive movement, like a punch. That's I was that I talked about that in the book too. It's the the grunts in tennis, right? Mm. But I think again, no one looks at anyone in tennis and says, "Okay, before you hit that ball, think, Ugh, 
you know, make right. a really loud noise. Judo right. does actually teach it. Judo teaches kiai. My kids both took judo. But mm. judo teaches that in the break fall, like they want you to yell. Yeah. Because they realize that that yell engages. RKC would do that in terms of, um, you, you watch like a, a real kettlebell person lift, or, you know, swing kettlebells. And they're very much like, you know, they're, they're breathing very, very um, consciously. Mm. And, and I think that's partially because they're trying to teach somebody how that, that these core muscles, they get engaged mm. by really hard exhales. Those hard exhales, if I say, you know, yell as loud as you can, mm. well, you're going to engage your abdominal muscles, whether, mm. it's a, whether it's a grunt, whether it's a key eye, whether it's a, a big exhale, swinging a kettlebell, whatever it is. Mm. So I think there's value there, but I think people get lost in the minutia also in that, in terms of, we don't teach it, we don't worry about it, but you will see, again, if you watch somebody hand clean heavy, Hmm. You may hear some grunts, hmm. but we're not teaching grunting. Right. It happen. It's like they aren't in tennis. Same idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so velocity-based training, you've mentioned that you made the move to time sprints. And um, I personally love the shift of the emphasis, you know, around power movements. And, um, you know, you mentioned the piece about filling buckets and how, you know, we could be potentially giving too much emphasis to strength and not enough to uh, some of the other components that are just as important. Like, could you maybe elaborate as to Excuse me. Um, as maybe why you made that shift or, you know? Well, I think there's no question that we've overemphasized strength and underemphasized power. We have a fascination in, I mean, it's in the term strength and conditioning. So we measure people if you talk to sort of someone who really doesn't know anything about strength training probably the first thing they'll say is how much can you bench right i mean they'll ask you some stupid question that relates to one rm type strength i think we've gone way way too far down that road and for us that's why we're thinking we always talk about body weight power so we're going to do jumps hops bounds light implement power. We're going to throw medicine balls. We're going to throw medicine balls. We're going to, we're always going to try to incorporate a chest throw an overhead throw and some sort of rotational throw so that we're going to, do, you know, we're going to get rotational patterns. We're going to get our push pattern. We're going to get kind of our, our chop, our anterior core pattern. Then we're going to go into the weight room. We're going to do something explosive with weights, whether it's cleans or snatches or trap bar jumps or whatever it is. The difference now is with velocity-based training, when you get to strength, are you now going to say, okay, I want you to lift this load at this speed? I think that's the next thing. It is not, in my mind, very practical right now. It is not very easy to do. It requires way too much time, way too much setup. I think somebody's going to figure out a way to make this really easy with some type of transducer that's mm -hmm. mounted on the bar, something that doesn't have a wire mm -hmm. that you can set up a lot easier. But I do think there's something to, particularly as people get stronger. So I'm looking, I got my son and his friends. They're all deadlifting. You know, they're in the low fours somewhere. Mm. But now I start looking and thinking, do I really want to chase five or do I want to stay in that like 0.6 meters a second and mm. try to, you know, sneak the weight up that way in terms of, hey, I want you to get to 340 for five, but I want them all to be at 0.6 meters a second. I think there's something there. We are mm. not there yet as a group, both from a cost standpoint, from an implementation standpoint, from a technology standpoint. I've been doing some work with um, the Iker from Vitruv, Vitruv, I don't know how you pronounce it, Vitruv, Vitruv, but um, mm. they're in Spain. They've got, but again, they've got a, a transducer. I think the linear position transducer, I think is what they call the, uh, the wire-based systems. Mm. We're playing with it. Uh, I still don't think that it's easy enough to use on in mass, mm. but there are, I think in the collegiate setting, you're seeing more and more coaches because they have unlimited funds who are mm. setting up. So, okay, I've got, I've got a, you know, a transducer at every rack. I've got an iPad at every rack. If you've got unlimited funds, it's probably a fun thing to play with. 
if mm. you have limited funds, maybe not so much. Mm. So what would you say um, when you're designing a program, whether it be adult population, athletic population, whatever it may be, what are some of the uh, principles or rules that you follow? Like, for example, I know, you know, for every push, you should do a pull. You know, do you have some other rules uh, or uh, well, principles? I mean, for us, yeah. I mean, the rules, everybody rolls, everybody stretches, everybody warms up, everybody does power exercise. Those for us are all rules. Those are all things that we're very hard on. We are not going to compromise in those situations. And then, as you said, when we get to, to strength training, it's sort of there are things, you know, like you said, everybody's, you know, we're going to try to do it. We're going to try to balance our pushes and pulls. We're going to try to balance our hip dominant stuff and our knee dominant stuff. Um, those are all, I think, some of the, I guess, the, the simplistic rules of strength and conditioning where you look at it and think these are things that everybody should know and everybody should do. And they're also things that in the same vein, I think probably get overlooked. I think there are coaches who don't hmm. do those things. And you look at some people's program, if you, because one of the things we've done is we always, we always um, evaluated our program and looked at injuries and said, okay, are we seeing injuries? And if we are, why might we be seeing them? So very early on in my career, a lot of shoulder problems, a lot hmm. of rotator cuff, a lot of tendonitis. And we realized it was because we pushed and didn't pull. So we might do, you know, we might have been a program where we did bench press and dumbbell incline, did six sets and then did three sets of lat pulls after that. So mm -hmm. we were two to one push to pull and the pull was a very kind of, I don't know, a lip service kind of pull. Like, okay, just do some pulling. Right. But what we realized is all of our guys with shoulder problems, and this was back when we had football at Boston University, but all of our guys with shoulder problems, uh, basically couldn't do a chin up mm. so they had a really large imbalance of pushing to pulling strength mm. so we tried to create that balance so now in our athlete program everybody does chin ups unless you have some sort of pre-existing shoulder pathology that prevents you from doing chin ups you're going to do chin ups mm. and we try to get really good at chin ups so again my son and his friends high school kids most of i would say not most half the kids in the group can do one single chin up with a hundred pound dumbbell now so they've gotten really strong at pulling. They're probably stronger at pulling than they are at pushing. Hmm. So, do you have uh, do you have them overhead press? Uh, not a lot, and mainly we don't have them overhead press because overhead press kind of when we think about it, you know, if we look at this and say, okay, pushing is coming out here away from my body, and pulling is coming in here away from my body. Um, you know, you look and think overhead pressing would be probably most akin to chin ups, hmm. but you know we've what we find is we spend a lot of time in the horizontal plane, bench press, incline bench press, and we just don't get to overhead, mainly out of time. So we'll do we'll do alternate dumbbell press once a week. That's probably as far as we get. You know, we again don't don't barbell overhead press. Don't don't probably prioritize overhead pressing as a a primary exercise. Can and you, maybe it, maybe that's a mistake. Is it also injury, injury wise? Like, is it? Uh, I don't. Not injury wise. No, there are certain people that we don't want to do it with, but those are we would sort of we kind of uh, I don't know. We sort of bucket them all. We we refer to them as throwers, but the reality is they're overhead athletes and they're people that are prone to rotator cuff tendonitis due to their sport, and they would be swimmers and tennis players and baseball players and uh, and maybe volleyball players. So we might, for injury preventive reasons, not prioritize those movements. But I, again, small subgroup really out of our larger group. And I would assume if uh, a general, if an older population individual couldn't overhead press uh, with body weight, so I mean, if they they don't have a good range of motion, yeah, they're not doing move it. to like landmines or something like yeah, that. Exactly. We don't. Our our adults don't. I mean, most adults. And I wrote an article about that. It might even have been in that book. I called it the airport screening test. You know, if you go in and you watch people try to go through the airport screening machine, I would say, I'm going to go on the high end and say 98% of the people that I see can't come anywhere close to getting their arms up over their head. 
those but, people shouldn't be overhead pressing and they probably shouldn't be doing chin-ups. So we yeah, tend to do it compensating, I'm assuming, right? Like, right, exactly. I mean, Without, to see that they are, you got a super arch just to get right. it up. But even, even with compensating, I mean, if you go to stand by the, I always watch the screen or I watch everybody that goes in, even with compensation, most people don't even get close. Most people are minus 20 degrees of, of shoulder flexion when you look at them. Mm. So, uh, so with all your exercise, exercises, whether it's overhead press or bench press or squat, are you generally trying to maintain a um, stiff core? So meaning where you don't want to over yes. arch? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, because I think naturally a lot of people, once you start getting them to overhead press, they start getting a big arch going and I guess yeah. trying to maintain that stiff core on your way up. Well, what they what they really want to do, I think, is they want to make it an incline because in, you can incline more weight than you can overhead press. So right. most people, if you looked at, you know, if you went old school and looked at old school kind of Olympic lifting, when the press was still part of Olympic lifting, most of those guys would actually do what amounted to almost a standing incline bench. By, mm. by developing so much lumbar arch that they were able to give their pecs leverage to help them effectively get the bar overhead. But the reality was the bar was never over their head. It was in front of their head. Right, right. They would stand up. And that's where I think people, again, don't really, don't look at it, I guess, in enough depth. So another big thing, a big term that's popping around, I don't know in the strength and conditioning world if it's as popular, but... Uh, my background is a little more physical education, although I've always had a passion for strength and conditioning and uh, did do personal training as well. But the term physical literacy and uh, with physical literacy, one of the big things that they say is developing like the motivation and the confidence of an individual. And I noticed in your, uh, you know, some changes that you've made over the years is considering an athlete's self-esteem. So, uh, you know, for example, as opposed to uh, emphasizing strength gains, you focus on growth. Um, you know, you've had uh, 2.5 pound weights in the gym. I'm sure there's different reasons for that, but it, you know, also helps with that slow and steady progress of uh, someone and in, in, in helping them to achieve their goals. Uh, maybe it's something like a 45 pound um, diameter plate. So even though it's a 25 pound, it looks like it's a 45 and you couldn't tell on the bar anyway. But the question that I'm getting at here is, do you think that some of those changes uh, made a difference in your program, like considering the self-esteem of the athletes and the people you're working with? I think that's the key to the whole program, truthfully. One yeah. of the things, when I very first started doing this, so we're talking, when I started training high school kids in the 90s, one of the things I realized relatively quickly was that the feedback that I was getting from parents primarily revolved around how the kid felt about themselves or how the kid behaved. It was not feedback relative to sport performance. Mm. It was more things like, wow, my son was never a hard worker. My son never really, you know, engaged sort of, you know, in the process. And now, you know, he's worried about what he eats and he's worried about all these other things. And that was when I realized there was a business in this because mm. I realized we're, we're producing behavior change that is then producing some sort of skill-related change in somebody as an athlete. But the behavioral stuff is way more powerful. And truthfully, in a, in a paid environment, it's worth much more to the parent. If you said to a parent, I'm going to send my kid to this program and my kid is going to become more respectful and more responsible and a better listener and is going to eat better. All these things are going to happen as a result of this program. People would be like, Oh, sign me up. Mm -hmm. And then I said, Oh, and by the way, they may actually get better at their sport. People mm -hmm. might almost look at you and say, Oh, that'd be a bonus. That'd be great if that could happen too, but I'll take all the other things first. So yes, I think that it's, it's been a huge driver for us and it's why we do what we do. It's why we don't test. One of the problems I think is that way too many quote unquote sports performance programs focused on sports performance mm. so what you did is you developed a program that rewarded the kids that were always rewarded mm. so you know when you're doing whatever strength testing or speed testing or vertical jump testing or whatever it is the kids that win were always the kids that won mm. and the kids that lost were always the kids that lost mm. 
And so you were perpetuating the same kind of have and have not environment that's such a huge part of high school. Mm. So what we did is we looked at this and said, no, wait a second, we're going to level the playing field. And if anything, we would look at it and say, we're going to be a little harder on these good athletes. And we're going to really put a lot of focus on raising the self-esteem of these not so good athletes. Mm. We're going to bring, so we're going to bring the good ones down a notch. And there's a great quote in talent code, um, Tom Martinez, who was actually one of Tom Brady's early quarterback coaches used to say, every kid's life is a mix of shit and ice cream. Mm. You know, if the kids had too much ice cream, I need to mix in some shit. If the kids <laughs> had too much shit, I need to mix in some ice cream. Yeah. And we didn't phrase it that well. He had phrased it much better than I probably could have. But that's exactly what we realized we needed to do is we needed to take some of these kids who maybe were not the best players and were not constantly rewarded in the conventional like high school athletic environment and make those kids feel really good about what they were doing. If we could do that, we would have a really successful business. Mm. And that's kind of where we're at, where, where we're at today. And you said also testing. So you don't emphasize testing, but you do monitor progress. What would be the difference? I think monitoring progress is just, you know, celebrating wins. Hey, that's personal best sprint. But well, they we're do it really hard. What we're trying to not do is we're trying to not make a big deal about the high performers. Mm. And that's, again, that's a huge mistake in strength and conditioning and in high school sports. The kid mm. who's a high performer gets a huge amount of recognition. Mm. But they're the kid, they're the man or the woman at school because mm. they're one of the best athletes and they're generally going to be the fastest kid and they're generally going to be the kid that does the most chin-ups and they're generally going to be the kid that's the best in the weight room. And mm. what we wanted to do was take a lot of that away and try to say, hey, all we're worried about is if you get better. Mm. That's where sometimes too, you know, you always think there were kids who were great in the weight room and not great in sports. And there were other kids who didn't want to go in the weight room who were good at sports because it was, it was like, okay, that's not my place. Like I'm not good there. Mm. We tried to get everybody in there and get everybody to realize that all we care about is better. Mm. Better than yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's some great gems right there. Um, you know, last couple of questions here. I'm going to respect time. We're coming close to the end, but uh, regarding warm up, mobility, activation, things in that realm, I feel like my mind has shifted a little bit and I'm probably nuanced, you know, I'm, I'm picking at the words a bit, but I almost think of my warm up as a movement education and uh, more than mobility or activation. So, for example, whatever exercise I'm going to do that day, like let's say, for example, uh, you know, we're going to be doing overhead pressing and you know, I have an athlete who is the big archer or, you know, teaching people, for example, just uh, how, how to move and how to move their body through a healthy range of motion, maybe teaching them, uh, you know, doing a plank in my warm up or, um, you know, having them hold a plank position while reaching or, uh, you know, moving through a healthy range of motion and moving my body in ways that it's intended to move. And I think about it a little bit more as movement education, more than things like flexibility or mobility or activation. And well, it's funny because Mark Verstegen coined the term movement preparation in mm. his kind of athlete's performance exos methodology. And it's actually a pretty good term. I just think, you know, I, we still call it warm up, but I think you're 100% right. I mean, you, it's not just, if it was just warm up, you could still go back to the old run to lap thing. Mm. And that's not what you want. What you want is, as you said, you know, movement exploration. Mm. You know, you're going to move through all these patterns. We're going to try to figure out how you move through these patterns with body weight mm. and, and very much these, um, these patterns that are going to be a part of what the day's workout is going to be. So what do you do for your workout routine? You still train nowadays? Uh, yeah, I guess not, not, a, I mean, I'm not like, you know, not a tremendous amount, but yes. <laughs> and the, um, I know this is a random one, but I'm scrolling back in my questions and I did want to ask it before I go the single leg deadlift. Um, I've seen different variations nowadays with the back foot on the wall. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are, if that, you know, if you think it might help an athlete to maintain the position. I don't, I don't think so. I think that's a, you know, that's probably a regression. If you have somebody who's going to really struggle, 
mm. but I don't think so now. Mm. And then um, un unweighted deep squats. So I know you're not a fan of deep squats, if I'm not mistaken. You guys use the box and go to a certain depth, and but unweighted. So like if I was in my warm up and uh, kind of in that movement exploration or movement education piece, uh, what are your what are your thoughts around unweighted deep squats? I mean, it, it depends on your definition of deep. I mean, we we like to squat to parallel. I don't think you know we will generally not squat kind of whatever ass the grass whatever you know however you want to look at it hmm. so uh, we're gonna um stray away yeah we're gonna squat but we're not gonna worry about you know putting a ass print on the ground yeah yeah uh i i went through a lot of my big questions here i know one would be too long to answer and i do want to reference your book but uh how strong is strong enough so you have actual numbers in there that um, say what a healthy male or a healthy female should uh, be able to uh, bench or sprint times, if I'm not mistaken. Or yeah, we've got all that's in the book, so that yeah. that's all there for people to be able to see. I big think the big thing is strong. We just have to get away from looking at strong as bench press, you know, power clean, back squat kind of strong, and look and think strong is one leg squats with with loads you know moving up towards 50 percent of your body weight strong is chin-ups with loads moving up to you know towards 50 percent of your body weight those are the types of things that are going to be the real demonstrations of strength as opposed to looking at the conventional barbell lifts hmm. yeah which i've found that it's actually difficult to find numbers out there for some of those lifts that you would recommend right so like a a unilateral squat um you know anything in that realm sometimes it, it's easy to find numbers on front squat and back right. squat and that's why we've started to put those out like we've said if you look at some of the alex de stuff that we talked about if you can do a single leg squat with 50 percent of your body weight in external load so if i weigh 180 if i can single leg squat 90 for a triple i get pretty good lower body strength i'm a double body weight back squatter so those numbers are there that you just I think you got to dig into the book a little bit to, to find the number, but the number is there. Yeah. And so when it comes to exercise selection for a beginner, uh, we would, these are my thoughts. And you tell me if you're, if, if I'm on the right page and if I read your book correctly, but uh, assisted chin-ups are a good place to start for a pull um bench press as opposed to push up because there's some people who can't push up but they can bench press um i believe bodyweight squat kettlebell deadlift bodyweight yeah. split squat reaching one leg straight leg deadlift those are all the things those are probably the big you know some sort of trx or ring row because you can scale them to various degrees of of trunk lean so i think those are those are the really big ones from a patterning standpoint. I did not to plug that. I mean, obviously we're talking about a book here, but also years ago I did uh, complete youth training. I think when my son was 12, so it's mm. probably about six years old now, but we went through all that stuff and it's still pretty good and I'm getting ready. I want to try to refilm some of the clips because it's very interesting to watch the effect of puberty. Cause I've got him and one of his friends, who's a girl who do all the demos and they're the same size at 12. And now if you look at it, the 12-year-old girl is the exact same size as she was at 12. And my son is probably, I mean, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 inches taller, you know, over that time. So it's pretty easy, pretty interesting to see the contrast of boys versus girls. What age did you start him? We started at 11, which is where we try to start everybody. He might even have started at 10 because he was being a pain in the ass and wanted to come to the gym. We actually, <laughs> interestingly enough, and then I do actually have to jump off because I got something yeah. I got to get to. but. Um, he started at 10 and then he realized it wasn't fun. And then we used to fight about going. And then at one point, probably when he was 11, I said, you know something, let's not go anymore. Go, mm -hmm. you know, you want, you're, we're always arguing. You want to play with your friends. You want to go to the park. You want to do this. You want to do that. Play with your friends. And then when you're ready, we'll start going back again. And relatively quickly, he came back and said, no, no, no. I want to go to the gym. I want to, I want to lift. I want to get better, you know, mm -hmm. at sports. Mm -hmm. But it was a good lesson for me in terms of, rather than fighting with him constantly it was like nope you know something you know we started too soon you're not ready 
let's do something else. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that really paid dividends. He's become, I mean, he's, he's very good in the weight room now as a high school senior. Mm. Look, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, coming on today, dedicating the time. I know uh, you're a hot topic. You said you do about two, one or two of these a week, it feels like. Yeah, <laughs> one or two a week. So I appreciate, uh, you know, being one of the ones that you jumped on for this week. And like I said, I've been following you for a while and, and it's been an honor to be able to chat with you personally. My pleasure. And now uh, one day I'll have to stop by. I've never stopped by the facility. Oh, Got to get up and visit. I know you said you would have come up and done it, but I was like, that's too much scheduling. This is a lot easier, but hey, you're welcome. Anytime you want to come to come and hang out for a day. So either way, I'll see you on Instagram. I appreciate you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.